seven o'clock. I'll call the Finance Committee meeting to order on Wednesday, October 7th. We have in the room Maury Creighton, Tom Parkins, Peter Twining, and myself, Sarah Mellish. There's nobody from the Finance Committee on Zoom. I expect no members will be joining us, but I'm not sure. So the purpose of this meeting is to have a hands-on workshop to go through the NBTA Communities Act fiscal analysis. My expectation is that we will not be taking comments from the public. This is really just a workshop for us to work through the issues and get it finalized. And there's Dean Nottis. <laughs> um, and then at 7.30, Chris LaPointe from Greenbelt is going to be joining us to go over the CPC request for 250000 So we'll break the workshop at that point, and then we'll reconvene the workshop. Um, hi, Indy. Hey, yeah. Good. Hey, hi, Donna. Come on in. <laughs> um, and Andy Olden has joined us. Um, Gail is under the weather and will not be on Zoom tonight. She'll be taking minutes off the recording. And she's asked people to remember when you speak, to speak loudly towards the camera. Yeah. Because yeah. some people have soft voices. Somehow, yes. Somehow, she never complains about my voice. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to laugh so loud. <laughs> I'm humble. So, so we've been asked to do this fiscal analysis of the MBTA Communities Act um, in order to distribute it to the taxpayers prior to our vote on our town meeting vote on November 18th. And the planning board has asked us to complete it sooner rather than later. So it's available when they start doing public hearings. Um, they did receive yesterday the input from the state on our preliminary submission. Um, there were no issues with the district selected. There were, there was like two minor comments regarding the actual zoning provisions. I think it's with respect to special permits and accessory structures. Nothing so, material. Nothing material. Um, so that's good news. <laughs> we were way off base. <laughs> um, so, so we need to kind of resolve the methodology we're going to use to do this fiscal analysis. And I've done all sorts of calculations. Um, as we discussed at our last meeting, the um, RKG has produced a report, a propensity for change, where they have looked at the acquisition costs and the construction costs and determined that there are only 34. Hi, hi Mike, right. come on in, have a seat. <clears throat> um, that there are only 34 units likely to be built in the area inside of 128 uh, because the majority of the infill is, is like one or two units and so it's not financially feasible to, to do large scale. Um, and then they also said that the Brady property was financially feasible to build up to the 100 units. It's a lot. Okay. Um, so we, as everyone's aware, we did a financial impact of the SLV project, 40B project. Um, that project was a little different in that we had actual floor plans we had room, we had apartment sizes, we had number of bedrooms, and we did two calculations. One was based on um, proposed new residents based on the number of bedrooms, and the other was based on the number of new units. And when we get down to the numbers, we came to a very similar result for the number of projected school aged children. Different from what was in their report. Right. Um, and so what I'm suggesting is we do the 34 separate from the 100. Okay. okay. Um, the 34, it seems to me that we need to rely on 
the number of new units and not try to guess how many bedrooms there might be. Mm -hmm. Because there's no requirements in the law. Despite the letter in the editor last week, there's absolutely no requirement for a developer to build any size, any units with any certain numbers of bedrooms. Well, I, I thought it says family friendly, which would that, imply that it's greater than one bedroom, whether that means two, three, four. But it's, but it's not required under the law. So that the family friendly was just their commentary as the excuse for the law. But in the actual law itself and what we submitted in our zoning to the state, which they preliminarily approved, there's absolutely no restrictions on the types of units you can build. Meaning when they're one, two, three, yep. or any number of bedrooms. Any number of bedrooms. There's no restrictions. What we've restricted is the number of units can, that can be built on a certain property and you're constrained by coverage requirements and height requirements as to how much square footage you can build and therefore the number of potential bedrooms. So if a developer finds that it's more profitable for them to build a bunch of one bedrooms than a bunch of three bedrooms, then that's what We just have to state the basis of our assumptions. And right. So, so I'm suggesting for the area within 128 that we just look at the number of new units as 34, which is what the propensity for change study came up with. Sorry, I came in late. Yeah. 134. So 34 within the 128 area and 100 out at Beaver Dam Road. I, I get the 100. Yeah. I, I, I get the 100. And but so 34 seems crazy low. Well, it's, right, it's, whatever, but it's whatever can be fit in and it's, in the gaps. It was looking at acquisition costs and construction costs and because the whole area is already built up. Um, you, in effect, have to tear down a structure, probably, to build new, a new unit. And we've constrained the maximum number of units so much that it's not financially feasible on the smaller lots to create um, a large number of units. So all of... Pine Street, um, we've said the maximum number of units you can have on a lot is five. So if you already have two or three, you're limited to adding two or three. Was Pine Street a four-story or a two and a half limit? Two and a half. Well, that was the That's a two and a half. Um, the, and so there were only, oh, I hope I have that report. There were only two properties on Pine Street that were deemed to be financially feasible to develop. And those were the two property, the two single family homes right in front of Newport Park. I just, at, at a super high level, the original number, and don't <laughs> tell me if I'm off my route, but the original number was like 550, somewhere around. Right. right. And, and then, then the 550 came down to like, again, 300 and some up. I was going to say 350. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. And that, the reason you went from 550 to 350 is just the simple math. If you designate a certain part of town that already has right. the exact same density that the law requires, then you can obviously tick that box, but no developer is going to, right? Why would they, right. when they can't add any units, what's What's the point, right? Right. Right. So I get I so I get the 550 to 350. But now I'm I'm trying to reconcile the 350 to what because I that's I another huge drop. Right. And I think it is um the report we distributed last week, because the lots are so small, the acquisition and the acquisition costs are so high and construction costs are so high that the lots are not large enough to build a lot of new units and therefore it's not financially feasible. It just seems like, I don't know, a lot of assumptions in there because I don't know, construction, I mean, I'm not a general contractor, I, you know, I mean, I'm, it's not my, but you know, I don't know, to try to make it some, and then to your point, okay, so some of those lots are small, but then, right, if the developer can buy Combines two lots, two lots like, yeah. you know, Clearly, if, if, if a developer can come in and buy up a lot of lots from a lot of different people, then yes, they can assemble a bigger piece and, and put it together. Um, I think 
one of the advantages, and I'm going to say this as not being fully supportive of the new law, but also feeling that we need to comply, <laughs> that one of the advantages is that the cost to acquire a lot in Manchester is so expensive. Right, but the reverse is true. You get more on the back end, right? So right. You, you do. You know, well, Mark, that, right. that, that, that goes both ways. Right? But this this was the study that was commissioned by um, RKG. So we can use that as a given for our study, or we can dispute it. Or... I mean, I didn't <laughs> see anything wrong with that um, because I think that. Pine Street is a place where there's some larger lots, but by restricting it to a maximum of five units, plus you can't have more than three units in any one structure. So you're, you're forcing away from an apartment building type built um, into these the small, and so therefore you need a larger footprint and give coverage, give them coverage is only so much footprint you can fit on a lot. Um, I didn't look at the RKG thing, so I can't really, you know, but the one that the one RKG thing I have on the brain is I did look at the study they did for Needham and the assumption they used for students was ridiculous. Now that's obviously not relevant to their math on development costs and right. all that, but I'm just, I'm just, I have that in the brain and that's something they did and that. You mean relative to impact on the schools? Yeah, like, you know, whatever the, you know, say it was 200 new units at whatever it was for Needham, yeah. their assumption was like 0 0.08 or something. Like, yeah, yeah. Are you, like what? So next to nothing. Well, ours is schools. even less. And um, I got information from the schools. Hypothetical um, 30 student increase. With 34 units, they, no, it would be only, if you look at the number of units in Manchester, only, um, 27%. There's only one 27% of, of the units number. Have, units a, have a child. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, so, that's, that's apples to oranges. Mm -hmm. You know, because if you're comparing 100 new, brand new condos up on the other side of 128, that's a different structure than, I mean, the whole town, obviously. I'm, I'm, <clears throat> I'm concentrating on the 34 first because I agree with 100 on the other side of 128. I think we need to use a calculation more tailored towards what LCP was doing yeah, yeah. and work off of that. But I think the 34 in town, the <laughs> thing that makes the most sense is to um, base it on the number of units. So the, um, the school information is, where is it? Are you looking at the Needham? No, I'm looking at Manchester. So currently Manchester has the, the, the enrollment number expected as of 10-1 is 651 children in Manchester in the public school system. Back in 2020, there were 823. Um, so we've lost 170. Yeah odd students from, from Manchester since 2020. Um, and <laughs> the so when you take the current number of units of 2433 <laughs> divided by the number of students, you come up with a 27% number. When the SLV study was done, it was a 32%. I know yeah. we had taken a harder and more conservative look. Yeah. We took like the number of households and the number of students and kind of ratio. Right. I thought we I thought I remember 45 percent then. So so does that mean for the 34 units it'd be like kids or something? Yes. Yeah. Nine kids. Yeah. For the 34 it'd be nine kids. Um versus if we looked at it the way we looked at SLV. I don't remember those numbers. So that was very distributed across single bedrooms where we didn't have any kids. Two bedrooms where yeah. we had a ratio of small number of kids and then three bedrooms where we assumed there'd be at least some right. So you used a 32% number. But, that, but that's blended across one, two, and three bedrooms, right? Yes. Right. That was 137 yeah. units. Because obviously for one bedroom, one bedroom, you assume zero, obviously. Right. Right. So it doesn't seem like a terribly different result. 
No. So it's the formula. Right. Oh, sorry. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and then, of course, the issue is, so the current cost per student is now 25099 based on that 651 account and the budget, fiscal 25 budget. Mm -hmm. um, in when we did SLV, it was 18225 per student in 2020. Uh, so we're not, we're not putting debt in there, are we? No. Operating. So I think there should be some discussion about whether we're putting debt in there. Because we've got high school that's halfway through with working life and we're carrying that debt. And we've got Memorial School, which is at the very infancy of its life, and we're carrying that debt. And so to do a per student cost and not throw debt in there. And I know it's all about incremental student ads, but, but, but you're not going to build new buildings if you've lost 160 odd students. No, but at some point in there, you got to have to deal with that. <laughs> and the, the study for the new school mm -hmm. yeah. is way down on the number of students. So doesn't the operating cost factor in? The debt, I think the debt's about 2 million and the operating is 16.3. So the debt is not a very large portion. But I remember with our SLV calculation, we came up with about 18.6 on operating on students per Manchester. And when you threw debt in there, it pushed that number up to 22,000. Mm -hmm. it, it was significant. Yeah. I mean, you went 15.1 million. And that was pre memorial school building being built at that boat on the program. I'll be honest, the only number I've heard that I agree with so far is the 25,000. I, I think the 134 is too low, and I think the ratio we use is too low. But the 25,000, and I'm fine <laughs> from the school committee. Yeah. No, but the point is, you could go down Maury's Road, and you could actually oh, you can go high. You can go high. He calls it debt. I would call it capex. It's the same yeah. thing. But you could go higher because you you're could. just covering operating. You're not covering capex. And, and and I think what we're trying to accomplish is what is the impact to the town of adding additional units? Mm -hmm. And if we don't need. If we're, if we're going to have fewer students, even with additional units, than we had when all the buildings were built, then we're not looking at the need to increase infrastructure in order to cover the projected number of additional students. And I think that's the difference. And I think it would be a whole different ball game if there were going to be so many students that we needed to add a building. Well, or that, but that's, but that's where the 134 comes into play versus the 350, right? If someone has a crystal ball and says that the 134 is like 100% accurate, then I agree. Then there's no way you can be entertaining a new school because even if you had one new student for each unit, which is, you know, that's not going to be enough to build a new school. But if, if, it, if it does turn out to be 350 units and each one of those units has one, like then you actually can start to get out of one. That you might need a new school, right? Well, but the other thing you have to remember is in the state compliance model, the assumed square footage per unit was a thousand square feet, including common areas. So, as much as they said family friendly, <laughs> a thousand square feet, including common areas, is, is not very family friendly. But that's that's a bare minimum. That was that's that was the. The compliance model used that number in order to come up with the required density counts. So that's the number that was applied. Right. And let's say I'm talking about the stuff north 128, right? Just because, you know, I mean, that could be a thousand feet per unit, it could be two thousand per unit, it right. could be three thousand. Exactly. Feet, right? Like right. it could be four. And right? so I'm suggesting for the, the portion north of 128 that we use the proportion that SLV had in their plans regarding one bedrooms, two bedrooms, and three bedrooms. Yeah, I, I, I still, that's way too low. Like we knew, we knew exactly SLV. We knew how many one bedrooms, we knew right. how many. So we were able to actually do a very good estimate because we were able to right. look at the one bedrooms and say, that's going to be zero students per unit, right? right. That's like a reality, but right. this is much more, well, and we don't even know if at Beaver Dam Road, number one, we don't know if he's going to sell it. 
it's probably likely he isn't, but even if he does, we don't know whether it would even be for families or whether it would be for seniors. They're not precluded from building things for seniors. I we just couldn't mandate it. But like, <laughs> I think part of our job is to err on the side of conservatives or caution, like, right? Like, I'm not saying you go to this extreme where you say 552 units times two students per unit, but I'm also saying you don't go, the, like, you know, you try to find a happy middle ground, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Or at least make an attempt to say this. We feel this might be conservative. Let's round up to 150 and go use that as a basis. Right. Like better to go too better to estimate too much no. and like come in the other way than to be come in upside down, right? I mean, what I was proposing isn't that much more right, from 34 to 50. So another thought on this, and it's it's probably not totally PC, but if you think about Shingle Place Hill, those are pretty high end units. And they're calling them affordable. Mm -hmm. Right. But they're not affordable. Right. I mean, they're. You're talking the 40 be shingle? Yeah. Okay. So that's a totally different economic market, potentially, than what we're talking about, about affordable housing being threaded through the community here. But the, 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 so we have permission to go up to 20% affordable. But again, it's at the 80% of AMI. Right. Now, a developer can build something at 30% of AMI if they want, but the, the restriction we had in the law was the maximum we could go with was 20% at 80% of AMI, which is the same as SLA. So, so the reverse is, so 80, at a minimum, 80% are full market, right? That's allowed, yes. And, and then maybe up to 20 is? Well, no, we've mandated 20% for anything with five or more units, and they can't make a payment in lieu of making, of creating a unit like they can today. So like the Surf Village, they paid the Affordable Housing Trust $178,000 for an affordable unit and they sold each of those condos for 1.2 million. So, so, 100, so 100 units of Beaver Dam, 20% have to be? Yes. And then 80% are full. Right, yeah. Um, the importance of the number we come up with is merely to indicate to town meeting the impact. I mean, there's no, would there be any reason to be other than conservative, that is, on the high side? No, I think we need to be reasonable. Hmm. I, I think that people out there are panicking and saying, oh, my God, we're going to add a thousand kids to the school system. The reality is we're not, because the reality is that you can only add one or two units to some of these lots. But to go all the way to nine, if I understand correctly, seems an extreme in the opposite direction. But, but that's what the consultant determined. I understand, was the propensity I understand but we're asking for an independent determination of, of the cost. I think that's our job, isn't it? That's what we're doing this evening. Right, but we have to have data upon which we base it. We think that they, we must use their data? That's what I'm suggesting. I, I think it's a valid report. Look, I'm, I'm all for a happy medium. I mean, I could certainly go to the other extreme. Yeah. I've seen, I'm sure you've seen, you know, the Middleborough one, yeah. you know. Which is crazy. A little bit, you know. <laughs> they're, they're assuming it's only two or three bedrooms, which is not the law. They're assuming 1.25 students per unit. Right. Well, which, yeah, that's high. But yeah, like, that's high. Yeah. but to me, honestly, I could, I put my hand on the Bible and it's, I was 0.75 to one, like to me, like, that's that's not unreasonable, especially if we're talking about the hundred units on the other side. Because if you're talking two, three, four bedrooms, to assume an average of one for each, I don't think that's that's not unreasonable. But it's not what we have today. But yeah, but we don't have an apple to apple. We don't have a thing like that. Like you're talking comparing that to the blended average of the town. Right. The existing residents. Right. Um, but we don't have a hundred unit structure with right. just two three four better three, condos four. is my point right. like, that, that's that's a unique yeah. new right. thing right. we don't have that so you're right for the for the units yeah. inside 128 you're right it's hard to argue against the blended right because right. okay but i'm saying okay for that one it absolutely could be very different right which is what you're saying and there's probably also a time phasing going on here oh. too. You know, you implement this, 
you know, of the 34, we might see four or five or six in the first three or four years. You know, we might see, who knows, it might be linear or whatever. The 100 could be six years in the making. Yeah, who boom, knows? Or it could be, but it, could be but it could be instantaneous too. Like, I mean, you just don't know, right? I mean, except that what the developers history. who were on the task force were saying mm -hmm. is that a storage unit business is very profitable from a cash flow standpoint. And it's much more profitable than rentals, residential rentals. Less hassle. Less hassle, no repairs, the, the no nothing. Yeah. The boxes Everybody's don't quiet. complain. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it makes it more difficult to sell a property like that to make it into residential because the current use is a more profitable use. I, That's, you know. I disagree with that. Well. I mean, look, just because the numbers would indicate that the person should sell doesn't mean they will, of course, right? Like, we don't know. Like that, right? That happens. But yeah. there's no question in my mind the math would say that you should. There's no question. Whether you will or not, yeah, I don't know. Well, with the CST would buy it, you put it on the market, you know? Right, we but don't, I mean, it's right. We don't. Um, but I just, I, you know, <laughs> there's nothing, there's nothing to compare for an existing situation for housing in town, right? For like a new hundred year, you know? Right. And, and then like <laughs> the other thing, when you compare this town to, I'd argue many other towns in the state, to me, it's, it's a very different animal because we have a very good school system and you don't have to go too far for like not as good school systems, right? So to me, I can I can draw people right. I can I can show you 15 towns within a 30 minute radius where those public schools are not as good, and so the second an opportunity, right? It'd be very different down in I don't know, Wellesley, West, and Wayland, where like right, if a lot already, of school systems, right? If you're already in Wayland, are you going to jump to Sudbury or Wellesley or whatnot, right? Like it's all the same thing. We're different, right? Like right. there's not, you know, yeah. So explain to oh. me and maybe others. Okay, let's let's. It's seven thirty. Let's pause this discussion and switch over to the green belt discussion. I appreciate that and also would offer if you want to continue this conversation, I've, I have nowhere else to be and it's interesting. So it's entirely your choice. I appreciate you accommodating my being here. Let's switch over the green belt and then get back to the. Okay. <laughs> I'm interested we to hear how late stuff. Don't put the questions down. I got it. Down. I got it. Okay. We have Chris LaPointe here from Greenbelt. Good evening, everyone. Chris LaPointe, I'm president of Essex County Greenbelt. Appreciate time on the agenda this evening. Uh, I have some, some maps of the project area that I can pass out. Apologize for the, the decrease. Um, as you are likely aware, uh, Greenbelt is uh, working on a project in Manchester and Gloucester. We have the opportunity to acquire about 330 acres of land. Uh, on at the end of Colburn Road in Manchester, and runs across the border into Gloucester and is adjacent to all of the existing conserved land up around Cranberry Pond. It's just across the tracks from Hooper Trask, uh, and then abuts more than a thousand acres of land that is owned by the city of Gloucester for watershed protection purposes. Uh, for those of you who've been in town for a long time, you will recall. The, the first phase of this conservation project in the late 1990s, there was a development proposed um, on the Manchester acreage at the end of Colburn Road. The conservation effort was, uh, was organized in which a 120 of the 150 acres in Manchester ultimately was protected with a conservation restriction. And Philip Normandy was a conservation buyer in that scenario, still owns the land now. Uh, 30 acres at the top of Long Hill was left unprotected, um, developable with access off the end of Colburn Road, but unprotected, so at the height of land. Um, subsequently, that landowner acquired uh, an adjacent 180 acres in, uh, in Gloucester from Boston Main Railroad, thus the 330-acre assemblage. Uh, 
we have the the opportunity to acquire all of this acreage. We have it under agreement for $3 million. The, the plan would be to for Greenbelt to own all of the property and have the management responsibility going forward. So hopefully you're familiar with Greenbelt, but we've, you know, we, we own, we've protected more than 21,000 acres across the county, but we own more than 8,000 acres of land, all of which is open in public, free of charge from dawn till dusk for passive recreation. So uh, hiking, biking, skiing, um, uh, and, and so forth. So the plan would be for us to own the land and be responsible for management, making sure that the public has a good experience up there. Um, on the Gloucester side, the city has agreed to hold a conservation restriction over that acreage, so an additional layer of protection over, over that land. Um, and on the Manchester side, um, we have submitted a, a request to the Community Preservation Committee uh, for a $250,000 investment from Manchester into the project. Should that go forward, should that be approved at town meeting, the, the town of Manchester, uh, through the Conservation Commission, would hold a conservation restriction over what is currently unprotected on the Manchester side. The rough funding scenario, but we would not acquire that land. I'm just a little confused about the particulars here. With respect to Manchester, yes, there would be a restriction, a conservation restriction. It would not be ownership. It would, uh, Greenbelt would not seek ownership of that land. Greenbelt would own the land. Would own the land. Yeah. Yes. And what's and, the necessity for a, a re restriction? Yeah. So a couple of things. The the funding plan for the whole project is um, uh, of the $3 million purchase price. We have a $1.1 $1 .1 million grant from the state through the Landscape Partnership Program. Um, that grant program uh, requires that, um, one, we have partners from the public and private sector. Um, mm -hmm. So Greenbelt, Manchester Essex Conservation Trust, City of Gloucester, potentially the city of, Man the town of Manchester. Um, the, the grant program requires that a component of this is that all of the land ultimately is protected by conservation restriction. Um, but the, the request to Manchester is really as part of the, the, the funding matrix that um, can make this happen. So we have $1.1 million identified from the state. We have uh, close to another 1.4 million identified between foundation requests, lead gifts, request funds, other fundraising that we're going to undertake. And so of our of our funding gap, which is around $550,000, we're asking Manchester to be a partner in the project to invest in a conservation restriction on the Manchester side. So the overall- that of Gloucester also on their land? So we have asked that of, of Gloucester, the difference between the land in Gloucester and the land in Manchester is notable. So the, the land in, in Gloucester certainly has value. Um, it does not have access. It does not have appraisable development value. So their community preservation committee um, cannot, and, and, and therefore the conservation restriction that they would hold does not have value. Um, their, the city supports conservation of their acreage uh, but Gloucester owns already, you know, north of 5,000 acres of land, and they don't want to own and manage more land. So they support the project as a holder of a conservation restriction. Because there is not appraisable development value of the Gloucester land, that conservation restriction has virtually no value, and the city cannot put public money into that portion. As opposed to the Manchester side, the developable portion of, of land at the end of Colburn Road, has significant value, the, the appraised value of the conservation restriction, the $1.35 million that's been provided to the Community Preservation Committee. And so the request of the town is to uh, help the overall project mm -hmm. get done and, and, and put 250 towards the a CR that's worth 1.35. Who owns the land in Manchester right now? Philip to Normandy. Private. Yep. How many acres, Russell? On the Manchester side? Yeah. It's 150 acres, 30 of which is unrestricted presently. 
So 30 acres is developable. Right. And the rest is restricted? The rest is subject to a conservation restriction oh, that's okay. been in place rest. since the late 1990s. Right. So, so if the rest is subject to a conservation restriction already, why do you need to own it? I mean, it's already restricted. Um, strictly speaking, we don't need to own it. Um, we're buying the, the, whole package, the, whole, the whole package so that we can own it, manage it as a unit, um, fold right. it up. Right, but but you could just buy the 34 acres and the whole thing would still be protected, right? Theoretically. Yes. Yep, but that's that's also not the not the the piece of land that's being offered. But you are you are correct. We right. could just buy the unprotected acreage. The remaining <laughs> acreage could be privately owned, subject to the restriction, and would be would be just fine. The opportunity that we see is is acquiring and bringing all of that acreage into common ownership and, and making sure that um, it is a public resource going forward. But if you acquire it, you will have a restriction on the whole piece of land, right? We will, yeah, the 30 acres. everything will be subject to a restriction. So right. if the town invests, it will be subject to a, a restriction held by the Conservation Commission. The existing Manchester Essex Conservation Trust restriction on the other 120 will stay in place, and then there will be one on on the land in Gloucester. So, so what if we don't pay 250? <laughs> if if the town is not a partner in the pro in in the project, mm -hmm. we will do what we always do, which is is do the best we can to find replacement money from other sources. And if that's the case, we're able to find money from private sources or other sources. Uh, Manchester Essex Conservation Trust would hold the restrictions so that we are so that we're able to comply with the state grant. You, you probably not going to know this top of your head, but I'll ask anyways. Do you know property tax revenue? It's about fifteen thousand bucks a year. So that goes away. I assume. No. Oh, I don't know. Is your land subject to taxes? If we own it. The land would be tax exempt. Yeah, it's not okay. a tax exempt. Yeah. We pay money out the door. Yeah. And we lose annual revenue. Right. Chris, I'd love some just to talk a little bit about, I can understand that. So everything within the red, mm -hmm. I want to be sure I understand, is what in one way or another you're seeking to purchase or otherwise right. acquire in some way. And that just, so it goes through some very strange gyrations. If I, am I so thinking about land, that right? The land that is on the, on the Gloucester side in particular does go through, does have these yeah, these old these, wood lots. Yes. So okay. If you were to see a plan of this whole area yes. from the late, from the early 1900s, this whole thing is carved up into these long skinny wood lots. Oh, wood lots. So oh, the city owns these bits. So actually, so I'm following, I mean, all this is the outline <clears throat> of the whole Correct. acquisition. Correct. And the 30 the acres. Unrestricted portion of the Manchester land. Thank you. Thank you. In the square. Was, was a piece of land that the town owns, which was part of that original project in the late 90s. And I believe that that has the potential to be a water tower, or that was the tower or a at the time. Fire tower. Or a fire tower, but it is at, it's at a high point. Oh, oh it's another question. Sure. I don't know if you know. This, this 30 acres, the part that is developable, like how many houses in theory could be built on that? Likely three single family homes. That's the that's the basis of the appraisal. Is that because it's on park land? Is there a lot of wetland? I, I, I think I'm that's the that's the that's the highest and best use appraisal. Hey, you think whether we're getting more than three? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. So, I, so yeah. So so uh, we didn't analyze what the most insane build out that's possible. So that's a different question. So let me clarify what my answer is. The appraisal. Of, of this property yeah. looked at the 30 yeah. acres on a three lot build out because three giant lots at the top of the hill has the highest value. That's what the, that's what a, what, what the, the, the easiest to develop, least infrastructure, highest return um, in that neighborhood is likely to be large lots. Um, that's not to suggest that there's not, I mean, it, that the land, that top of the hill is high and dry. It's 30 acres of high and dry. And has views? Or is it covered with or Your second floor up by trees? It's covered up by trees now. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll come at it this way. I know Sarah will know this. What's minimum building? Well, 
I think is this district E? It would be two acres. Two acres. Two acres. So I don't know the design, I don't know the frontage, obviously, but just the true answer is probably more than access. Those are existing trails, I think. Trails and the existing road yeah. for access. Hiking and wilderness trails if they dot the again. Where's the where's the yeah, where's the access? Colburn Road isn't called out here, but Colburn Road comes in here. Yes. Kind of next to Pond Population area. Oh yes. Oh, so it's not on okay. So it's not my, my it's very short. it's very faint. It's not yeah. Okay. Oh, I think the, you know, the, the conservation of land in this area is called out in your master plan. It is a, it is a, you know, this type of land conservation is called out in your open space plan. It protects Cap Brook, protects Wolf Trap Brook. It is the, it's, it's a, always a fair question in conversation about whether it's an appropriate investment, what does the town get for it? The town's own planning documents identify these areas as critical to being protected. So that's that's the starting point. And this is a tremendous recreational resource of regional importance. And it's um, you know packaged at this point in a way where we're able to bring the opportunity to the town at a fraction of the total cost using CPA funds, cash on hand. My understanding is that there's about a half million dollars in cash on hand. It's still our taxes. <laughs> I pay I pay into the CPA in Hamilton and we've made choices about spending our tax money on, on I guess what I struggle with is I have no issue with putting a conservation restriction on town owned land. I struggle with paying for a conservation restriction on land that's being purchased by a nonprofit that's going to protect it anyway. That's what I struggle with. If I could, if I could clarify, so that's a that would be a fair question. If I were coming to you today and saying, Greenbelt owns this land and would like you to pay pay us for a conservation restriction, what we're what we're actually saying is we have the contract right to buy this land. We're amassing funds from the Commonwealth from a grant program. We're raising money from foundations. We're asking the town to be a partner in the acquisition. We're all going to go to this closing together. The fact that you are um, where the 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 conservation moment happens at that closing, but we would all be there together. It enables the whole transaction. That's right. what you're saying. That's right. We're, we're already short of money, right? We're already trying to come up with money for schools, PFAS, like all this right. stuff. Like, I mean, if you could put together the transaction privately or with yeah, you know charitable true. funds, like more power to you, because yeah. it's still a net negative because we still lose the fifteen grand a year in property taxes, right? But to suggest that we come up with town money to like out the door and then loot, like, I, that seems so crazy. Like, I think one thing to think about here is mm -hmm. twofold. Is one, the 15K in taxes may have, may just disappear anyway, because this project may go forward, whether Manchester's part of it or not. And the second part of it is, it's, it's a little different than tax dollars that can be allocated anywhere. So this is CPC. And as you remember, and Dean can speak to this, but CPC is basically open space on the recreation. Historic preservation and affordable housing. And, and we've got, we collect into that every single year. And you've heard me say over and over, we have all these applications come and we built these vinyl signs at Singing Beach, you know, that teeter and totter. And we've spent a crap load of money on Kroll Chapel, you know, and, you know, roofing and pointing. I mean, $600,000 went into uh, Kroll Chapel over the course of like five years. So these funds are somewhat restricted in how they can be used. And, and I think that is something we really need to take into consideration here because they're just going to sit there waiting for the next project. I, I'm, 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 I'm 100% with you that we need to be more targeted, sophisticated, educated, right. strategic, whatever word you want to use on CPC funds. I'm 100% right. with you on that. And, and But to me, that's like a separate conversation like that's you know what i mean like yeah but i don't think it really is i mean we struggle to use cpc funds for affordable housing and the, and the problem is in order to make a dent in affordable housing you need to probably have close to a million dollars to buy a lot or seed money to do something significant and we're not there and then we're always struggling to figure out what could we do with this 
And at the same time, I think the taxpayers ask a reasonable question, which is you're collecting this money. Well, how long are you going to sit on it and not do anything with it? So, you know, here's a project coming along that has some benefit to the town, has some benefit to a lot of things going on. And I would advocate that it's got more benefit than building more lights and the corner of things and vinyl signs and stuff like that, which, I mean, we're so restricted on this, we can hardly use it for library renovations because it doesn't fall within historic stuff. So we got roofs falling down, but we can't use the funds on Again, it. Again, so. I'm 100% with you that CBC is a problem. And if it right. was up to me, I'd blow the whole thing up, but I, I would eliminate it. I'm like, if that's the road you want to go down, I'm, I'm down that road. I'm way ahead of you because I think it's, you're right. It's well, crazy. But that doesn't mean you just kind of do a hurry up. and like, well, you know, here it is. And so let's like, it seems so counterintuitive and illogical that on the one hand, we spend the first 30 minutes talking about adding housing. And now we're going to do something that detracts from the ability to build more houses, whether it's three houses or five or whatever that like, that seems crazy. To me. I can't like, we can also amass the funds so, up to the million. Can't, I mean, we could. The answer to the public is we're amassing it towards public housing, you said, which is uh, affordable housing, which is a, a million to play in, to in be, the field. To be fair, the Affordable Housing Trust has 1.5 million to make. Okay. And we've been donating like 200,000 a year. Okay, okay. okay. So, yes. oh, but we do, we yes. were told. Right. Thank you for the comment. Yeah. 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 We were told at the end of last year, the CPC anyway. That it would be okay to build a kitty because they were talking about Sweeney Park, the senior center, an outdoor bathroom, the Newport parking area, singing beach bathhouse. I mean, there is a list of, of good things that we can be doing if we build a kitty. But um, getting back to the other question about this not being a, a purchase, that it was a, 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 um, a thing that I brought up at the CPC meeting that we're under open space acquisition. And is it re with respect to the town, it's more open space preservation. Um, that, that, that there is a distinction on the, on the application that from Manchester's standpoint is it's not really an acquisition. It is from Greenbelt. So I had a, a procedural thing on what the state would say about that as well. As to the qualification for the yes. funds. Has anyone asked the state? I mean, I've, I've done, this would be probably the, the 30th of these that I've, that I've done. That With is, CPC that is, funding? Yes. Okay. So, and it's always been under, so you would know better. I, yeah, I, it, I, no, 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 but it, but it and, and it's also, I mean, those are, those are, those are both allowable. Yes. I, I, I agree that they are allowable uses. Right. So whether, but it's whether it's one or the other. An acquisition. You know, or a, um, so finish your comment, Chris. I'm, I wonder where you're going now, right now. You were, I was just, I guess I would, I would offer, if there's a question about that, certainly the Community Preservation Coalition yeah, would readily clarify that. Yeah. Um, uh, towns using CPA funds have certainly bought lots of land, which yeah. is very clear. Yeah. They've also bought conservation restrictions as part of these joint projects. So Donovan Reservation, Sagamore Hill, and Hamilton and Ipswich and Essex, same situation. Greenbelt brought money to the table, state grants. Hamilton, my town bonded $1.75 million of CPA money at town meeting to buy a conservation restriction. Essex put CPA money in to buy a restriction, DCR. It, we just it, we all came to the closing together. So it's a it's a it's a common um, it's a common approach. I think Manchester also has history of this because with Alpers, the Alpers property. I think about six years ago, I mean, we had this as well with CPC funds with the restriction. Yeah, it was a little different. Yeah, it, was it's, different. It, it was town, there's a, it was more town, town access there, but we certainly use CPC funds. And ultimately, this you know, protect this would be a question for voters, right? Right, so right. Not, not for us to decide. So we just have to decide right. whether we're gonna support it, support it, it right? or not. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I, I had one other, um, for a reason to justify us spending the 250000 would Greenbelt entertain somewhere down the road in the future of working with us if we were to say need to put a third quarter 
from Atwater Ave down to Summer Street through here at some point in the future. I mean, order for what? For a road <clears throat> to, to relieve School Street and Pine oh, Street oh. as the, the development progresses. Um, I mean, it, I was looking at trying to squeeze something through here. I, I had a, a nice route, but um, I, I know we're a way, ways away from that, but if stuff gets started, build it out in the limited commercial district, it's really gonna put a lot of pressure on those connected roads. Those two, you know, School Street in particular, which is overheating because everyone, every student from Essex has to go through that Pleasant Street intersection. Right, in but morning. your problem is, is your access over 128 is not Yes, no, <laughs> yeah, exactly. But I mean, in the old days, we used to build bridges. <laughs> And that's why, and the other thing with Gloucester, they, they say there's no access, but a simple bridge off a of Klondikin Road or a crossing, and all of a sudden that whole area is accessible to the development they want. So, you know, there is a, a good reason to to buy that land. It's right in their watershed. They're not. So, I don't know. There, there's a lot of questions. Can I just clarify the question that the, the city, the, the question about why the city isn't buying it? They said that it was because it's not accessible. Well, yeah, the the number of just like your CPC needs to ensure that the money that is invested is mm -hmm. is, is appraisable, right? That there's a that there's an appraisal done to appropriate standards that demonstrates that there's value. Gloucester would have to do the same thing. So you you're not wrong that right. if you if someone bought a property on Condolan Road and negotiated rights to cross the railroad and then got to this land that perhaps they could do something. Right. No appraiser is going to assume A plus B plus, you know, these five things have to happen right. and, and therefore it's worth a bunch of money. Right. The, the, the city's not, your, your town wouldn't want to invest money in that and the city won't either. So I agree with you. Yeah. And a reason we're interested in it is yes, I think there is development potential there, but it's not appraisable as it sits today. I would support the use of CPC money or something like this because I think it has value uh, for the town. Um, preservation of this kind of property, I think, has value. Um, and especially in light of. You know, regardless of where we go with CPC down the road, we have it today. There's money in the in the, in the account, and I would much rather see it go towards some sort of tangible. Even if you know we're not necessarily holding the rights to it, it's being held you know on our behalf, and and I think uh, it's a it's a far better use than you know, the, the myriad projects that we're trying to see here. It won't be that. It's driving me crazy. I mean, some of the CPC funds have gone towards good things. things. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, yeah. right? Like to do renovations on Bad things house. that otherwise the town would have had to. Well, didn't we? Didn't the CPC money go towards the Pine Street? Did? Yes, it did. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But that's right, because it was a natural field. It couldn't go toward term stuff. Right. We right. talked about that. Right. Yeah. Child child field. Field. Am I wrong? Thinking that CPC went to Charter House. Charter House. Yeah. yeah. They got by the maintenance turtle somehow. That's right. They, that it, was was it was maintenance. Maintenance, right? It, it defers so long that it becomes rehab. <laughs> that seems to be the, <laughs> the down strategy. There are a lot of there are a lot of constraints on its use. So I think for the bathhouse, for example, you know, it used to have like cedar floors or something, and they wanted to go with plastic materials because of bare feet, and plastic materials don't qualify for historic preservation. So, you know, suddenly it can't be used for this or that. I mean, there's there's these little narrow pathways where. Um, no, we're on the same page that at a high level, it's like yeah. more trouble than it's worth, I think, right? Especially at a 14%. It's like, it's like we're chasing, right, what, what was it? 14. 14. 14. Now right. we're from 100. When it we're chasing a 14% match. It's like, you know, it's like someone telling me they're saving money on taxes because they're spending more money on interest to get the deduction. It's like, okay, it's not, so not coming out the right way. Where are you falling on this, Tom? I kind of see both sides of it. I'm still struggling. Okay. Okay. I, mean, I think I'm leaning towards Maury and Andy, but. You? Against. Against. Dean? 
I'm going to find a supporting because I think down the road it's going to be good. Why? Yeah, I guess. So have we discussed it enough? Yes. Right. Um, I'll make a motion that the town of Manchester support the investment of $250,000 for the purchase of this, uh, to support the purchase of this property using CPC funds on hand. Do I have a second? A second. Andy seconds. Any more discussion? Take a vote. Mike? No. Dean? Yes. Tom? Yes. Peter? No. Andy? Yes. Lori? Yes. And Sarah will just. So we'll support. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Back to the workshop on the MBTA zoning fiscal analysis. I don't have a question. I did. <laughs> so explain to me so I have a good understanding, maybe for other people too. What's the negative side of taking a slightly more conservative approach on the stupid issues Mike is suggesting? I just think it needs to be realistic. Okay. Um, that the challenge I have is we've lost 167 Manchester students in five years. I struggle to find out, to, to figure out how 34 new units will adversely impact the cost of our schools. That's where I'm coming from. I, I think the 100 out of Beaver Dam Road, that's a different story. But I, I think that the 34 units within the 128 zone, I, I just struggle to figure out how it's going to impact us from a financial standpoint. Here's the problem of using the current, when you take, what is it, 22 household, 2200 household, whatever the total 2433. 2400. You take those 2400 households and you say, okay, across the board, right, you're taking one number and it's 27% or whatever yep. it is. And to use that same number for like 10 new units, 20, whatever, you know, it. <laughs> there's a lot more to it than that, right? Like, meaning, I'd almost want to look at the last, I don't know, 100 real estate transactions in town and see like who, you know, who moved in. Because my gut would say it's not, you know, an 80 year old elderly couple moving in to buy a new, it's, it's a young family like happened near me. You know what I mean? So like it's changing the demographic. I guess what I'm struggling, I understand what you're saying, Mike. What I'm struggling with is the fact that this finance committee put together a report, for SLV, and they used the 32% number which was based on the number of students per unit in Manchester. And so now I'm struggling with why would we adopt a different approach um, for a similar type of situation? At a bare minimum, that 32 is blended across one, two, and three bedrooms, right? For SLV, right? It was, it was, it was 32, 32% of the units would have school-aged children. And right, that's the right. number that was used. But that's a blended across the one bedroom, two bedroom, three. So my point is that's an average. We plugged in a zero for the one bedrooms, and then we plugged in a number for the two bedrooms and a number for the three bedrooms. And the average of those three is that 32. Right. So why right. why is this any different? Why would why if the number is now declined to 27%, why is that any different than the 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 thought process used to get to the 32%. That's what I'm struggling with. Why is that not acceptable anymore? Okay, fine. So why, why would the ratio of rooms be different? Like units with three bedrooms, two bedrooms, one. Just so I'm clear, the 32 yeah. was what we used for SLV, right? The 27 is just, that's the that's the across the board average for the whole town. Yep. Am I right? Yep. Okay, so so to say that it declined from the, that's apples and oranges. The 32 is SLV, the 27 is just take all the households in town, and just divide the kids by the number of households. Those are two different things, right? And all I'm saying about the 32 is, the 32 is lower than it would have been if, let's say it was only two and three bedrooms for SLV. Let's say it was only three bedrooms, right? That 32 clearly would have been higher. 
right? <clears throat> because part of that 32% was zeros for the one bedrooms. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a third, of, I think a third one bedroom was a third two bedroom and a third three. If I remember, I don't know. No, it was, it was um, heavily weighted for uh, towards two bedrooms rather than three. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, my point is there were some one bedrooms. Yes. I guess that's my end of the day point. There were some one bedrooms in the SLV. In my brain, I don't see any of these being one bedrooms. Like Why? For economics, for the fact that, I mean, we can debate about the, you know, family friendly thing, but like, right. I just pulled it up. It's, it's there. Like, it's, it's, it's not in the law. It talks about family friendly, but the law does not restrict you with respect to the number of bedrooms you need in a unit. Mm -hmm. In both directions. And our zoning that we submitted to the state, which they gave preliminary approval to, does not restrict, does not state how many bedrooms there needs to be to a unit. There's no reference to that at all. This is right off section 3A, and it has the clause, shall be suitable for families with children. I know. Am I like where? Where am I reading this? What I'm saying, Mike, is that is a feel-good statement by the state. By the state, it's it not. Lot. It's not, not a binding, statistic, and it's not a requirement no that metrics. they put in for us to include in our zoning. There's no metrics to it. Oh. They put it in because there's an impression that this is right. for single people only. I mean, or the not, state put yeah. the language in the law. I mean, I, I don't, I just, I don't understand how you can say it's not part of the law. It's like, not part of what we're required to do for zoning. But it's wording in the law. It's, it's, it's not, it says family friendly is a very um, generic term. Absolutely. But a one bedroom is not family friendly. Like but, that's like, that doesn't but make But the any... law, the, the, the regulations do not have any reference to number of bedrooms required. That's not what we're required to do. We can both be correct on that. You can be correct in saying there's nothing in the law that says you can't have one bedrooms, but I could also be right saying that the law says suitable for families, which implies that like one bedroom doesn't the work. The state is not enforcing that in our zoning. The state is not saying we need to include, we, our zoning needs to reference number of bedrooms. So we don't need to do it. So, so it's up to a developer whether they build three bedrooms or one bedroom or ten bedrooms. Okay. I guess I won't even. Then I'll just go defer to economics, and the economics would say that they're going to make more money on a two, three, four bedroom than, they, than they would on a one. So, so sir, I hear you talking about us being reasonable. Right. What's that range that would fit within your concept of reasonable? That's a range. That term refers to not just one number. I'm looking for something that's closer to, I think, the question what? Tom, which is, is uh, if anything, I'd rather be conservative and have that number I was, within that range you want. I was going back to what the Finance Committee de determined was reasonable when they did the SLV. The no, there's not. Uh, okay, well, I'm not with you. Well, even if we were assuming... We 100% knew exactly the data with SLV. Like, oh, what, what, I agree with that. So, so it, so it is different in this, in, at least at a bare minimum where we don't know, like, right? Like we don't know, at least SLV, we knew that all the units, the numbers, we knew how many were one bedroom, right. how many, like, so. Well, we don't know what the metrics are uh, gonna be for the development of a hundred units. I mean, they could be the same ratio as SLV. And that's what I was suggesting that for the hundred unit one, we do a pro rata of the SLV. I'm calling more comfortable with that than, than dealing with a 34 number. I don't, I don't have the model. I don't know that bedrooms are automatically more profitable on a square foot basis than one bedroom. So I think SLV put together the, the breakdown that they provided to maximize their profits. My point is, you could assume that the 100 units at Beaver Dam is going to be 100 one-bedroom units, and I could assume they're going to be 104 bedroom units. And guess what? We both have just as much chance of being correct. But like, what I was that's my point. With, with, whereas SLV, but, but neither of us is saying that. I'm right. saying I'm saying based it off of SLV, unless right. there's a good concrete right. argument. To that's make. my suggestion for Beaver Dam Road. But SLV, would we need like yes, yeah, but we have to make an assumption. And what I'm suggesting for Beaver Dam Road is that we extrapolate from the numbers we had for SLV, so that it is um, 
I'll tell you the numbers, some numbers I did. It is 63.7% the size of what we did for SLV. Because the calculations done for SLV were for 157 units. And 100 units is 63.7%. Yeah. So if you took that number times the appraised value they had. Yeah. Um, and then appraisals have increased 26% since fiscal year 21 in Manchester. You would come up with an appraised value of about 37 million, which would be taxed as about 346,000. This is just pure debt. Yes, just, 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 just be Just be Oh, a ratio. Right, to come up with the assessed value and then I'm suggesting that we do the same thing for the school age junior. Um, we had 50. Um, and if you do a, a portion of that. You know, 30, yeah, which is what you come up with if you do the 27% of the number of units. The numbers come out the same. I mean, I, I, I could. I could see, okay, we, we look at the ratios that SLB had and we say, okay, let's just for the sake of conservatism, let's be slightly more conservative than SLB was. Let's let's play with those ratios. Let's assume that, you know, instead of, you know, 30% one bedroom units, we're going to say it's 20% and that it's, you know, it's 40% two bedrooms and you know, the remainder are three bedrooms, something like that. That's, that's, some sort of a rationale that I think I could, you know, get behind. But if, if we want to try to be more concerned. So and then on the SLB thing, just to go back to that, we, Mark and I worked pretty hard on that. And the number we came up with was closer to 90 students. And that was because we said, okay, a two bedroom is very possible to have one student in it. And a three bedroom is more likely to have a student or two in it. Right. And so we ratioed all that out. And at the end of the day, I think we all collectively on this committee got cold feet when we said, I think it's 96. And SLV came in and said, we think it's five. Yeah. <laughs> and we said, whoa, big gap here. Let's be safe and average. So that's how we came to kind of the 50. I would say maybe we were a little aggressive, but we went over those numbers and probabilities and expected numbers of kids a lot. I mean, we had spreadsheets that were smoking on this thing. I think SLV probably said, we really want to pass this thing. Let's just see if we can get away with six. And they threw that number out. So at the end of the day, I think if they were more honest, their number might have been closer to like 25. And we probably would have averaged in somewhere around 60, mm -hmm. 65, maybe 70. But so I, I just, we, we keep talking about 50, but I think we did come to middle ground. And, and, and the data point from SLV was, in my humble opinion, laughably low. And, and to your point, I, I agree with everything. Like, SLB probably just threw out the five or six, just like, why not, right? Like any kind of negotiation. We come in at, whatever you said, 90, 96. The second we propose splitting the difference, that, even that number was probably way better, right, than any number they could hope for. So, of course, right, they jump on it. But that's kind of that situation transactions different. I'm with you. Like, if we, you said 90 out of... What was the total number? So, 130? 157. 157. It's it's the 164 percent. Well, it's it's. I've got it here. See, like that. But but to your but to this point, you know, when we look at the 34. I think that the 34 is threaded through a community that's already existing. So it's it's adding a space to an existing house, that sort of thing. So it's like it, it's. I don't think we can sort of say, okay, it's huge. But I think the model for Beaver is different because right. that's that's like right. open territory, control, alt, delete. What are we going to do with this phone? Um, so it really is two different models when you get down to it. Right, I and that's here. why I that's thought the we challenge. Yeah. separately. Yeah. And, and that's why if on the 34, 
we use the current percentage, you come up with nine students on that portion. And then for increased assessments, you could assume 1,500 square feet per year if you wanted, which is not unreasonable in Manchester. And if you used the... And if you had a 1,500 foot square foot unit, you would you, typically if, have a one bedroom? I mean, would that be big enough to... It could be a two bedroom. It could be a two bedroom. Sure. Yeah. Um, if, and if you use the assessments from Sawmill Circle, which is kind of the, the newest build I could find that was multifamily. Those are assessments are like about 350 a square foot, <clears throat> which would bring you in at um, which would Bring you in assessed to 525 um, and 525 times 9.35. This tax is about 49 for you. Not including CPC, that's just this. That's right. Does that seem reasonable for the 34? My problem with the 34 is the 34. Well, I, I was going to say, um, I thought we were like compromising to go from 34 to 50. And even if- On what if, basis? That 34 seems low. Yeah, but you can't just say, well, just, 34 just, seems slow, so we picked 50 out of the sky. Start with 550. So, so if, if we had 50, and even start if that- 550. Um, so, so if we had 50, and we go with a 35% ratio for students, We'll come up with 15 students. But even at that, I agree with you that that's almost going to help our school system be more efficient. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to help with the ratio with Essex. It's going to do a lot of things. So I don't think the schools are a big negative impact. I, I no, think, I think what I'm hearing from people is that they're scared about the congestion and the aesthetics. Um, and that it, there's a good chance this might not pass, is from my, my, or my barometer of from people I know. Well, that's not our problem. I know, but our I'm just problem. saying, I'm so just, what I'm analysis. saying, let's not beat a dead horse on the students because I don't think the schools is a big factor. I think that these other two issues are, are well, much more a concern. And I don't know how to put a monetary cost mm -hmm. on that. It's going to be hard. But, that, but that's so the once point. You, once you figure out the added population and who that population is, then you start thinking about costs to serve that population. So to your point, Dean, if we've got older people, we're, we're dealing with fire and oxygen and, you know, and that's the cost element. If we're dealing with younger people, it's a school system. And, and, you know, we talk about 18 K or 21 K or debt load of 25 K, but if we have a special needs person roll into this equation, you know, now we're maybe talking 80 K we're talking hundred K and oh, by the way, we're carrying that through, however many yeah, years they're in the system. We, we, so it's all part of the cost fabric. But here. you don't have to go based on what the schools are seeing today. You can't just say, well, we don't think we like the population of the schools, so we're gonna make an assumption there's gonna be more special needs. The school numbers take into consideration the special needs in district and out of district. Right. So that's part of the money. And that's when we divide the operating by the number of students that the town, that's a fair way to look at it. Right, but if, if, if we've lost 167 students in five years, right. adding whatever well, the number is, is not gonna materially impact the cost of the schools. Right, and I would venture to say if that trend continues for another five or seven years, we have bigger problems than worrying about these 15 students, you know, we, but that's another dialogue. Right. So, what do we need to agree on? We need to agree on some numbers. We need to agree on the 34 and the 100 or 
something around that. We know right? the beaver dam. Once, no. once we know the numbers, we, we then need, it can work. We, we know that beaver dam road cannot be more than 100 because there's a cap in the zone. So that is, that's uh, limited to 100. 100 is enough. So 100 is one thing that there's no. No good. questions about that. One of the few things not in there. Yeah. So we don't, we don't, talking about 30. we don't know whether it's going to be family friendly. We don't know whether it's going to be seniors, but I think we have to assume that it's families. I mean, you know, okay. normal apartments. That's, I mean, I'm more comfortable where we are with Beaver. I know. Than, you know, than with the downtown. So for D Beaver, what assumptions are we making? So, I was going to ask, do we have any sense of what our peer communities are doing with MBTA and this thing? So, for example, well, we, um, we saw, I've seen what Middleborough did, which is, I'm sorry, but a laughing stock. Um, so they went to the state saying it was going to cost them all this money because all of their units were going to be three or four bedrooms. And it was going to require them to build new schools. It was requiring them to build new water towers and sewer treatment plants. Now, one of the things in the law is that if, if a proposed development, if, if the current infrastructure, water and sewer infrastructure is not sufficient to support the proposed development, you can deny the building. Say that again. If, if the existing water and sewer infrastructure in a town is not sufficient to support a proposed development, you can deny the building permit. Except for SLB. Well, of course, a 40B, that's okay. different. This is a law. And in this law, they specifically say, if, if the town doesn't have the infrastructure to support development, you can deny it. And Middleborough was using that? Middleborough was saying they were going to need all this new infrastructure. Well, water and sewer. Specifically water. And water and sewer, yeah. That's why I say what they did was kind of laughable. Oh. So another why, I don't, Hamilton. I don't know their water, I don't know their water system, because but like law, because this this particular law says if you don't have the infrastructure, you can deny the building permit. Right. And what I'm saying is I don't know Middleborough's current sewer and water system, but I'm saying what if they were at like what if today they're at hundred percent of capacity, yeah, then then clearly adding any units means oh, they, they don't- They can pass the zoning and then deny all the building permits because they don't have the infrastructure to support it. Sense. Yeah, it's, yeah, you comply yeah. with the law and then you deny the building yeah, permits. Exactly. You comply with the law but, and but then you it's deny it's because, because you've got the law on your side with the right. water. Correct, you avoid right. the state right. suing you and you still have access to grants. But sir, it sounds like what you were saying was they built a case for these extremes of three and four bedroom units. Right. Which I'm required. In order to make a case that they didn't have the infrastructure. Yeah. For the their, their argument is that the law is an unfunded mandate. Okay. And if it's unfunded mandate, the ta the state has to fund it. And so they were coming up with well, millions and millions of dollars. They said the state would have to pay them to fund them. So you're saying they want to pay state taxes instead of local taxes? Yeah. I'll be the first. I'll be the first to agree that they that their assumptions, you know, obviously were on this end. Right. But I feel like. All we're talking about here, we're like over here, like, and so I, I just want to be in the middle. Like, I'm not, I'm not suggesting, you know, and to me, it's like any other kind of negotiation, whether you're negotiating a business or a house or salary, like, right? You, people can start at the extremes and then you, right? You usually end up haggling to the middle. Right. And, you know, so over here, you got, if I go the middle bar route, you got 550 units, two kids per unit, right? That's this extreme. And then, but I can't develop. Because there's no water. <laughs> so it's like, that's then, then you, you know, and then you got 0.27 students per unit, you know, and 134 over here. And like, I'm just, you know, should be in the middle. And I, another one, uh, Hamilton, I've heard, is joining, joining Milton in the amicus brief. Yeah. It says <laughs> that, um, but no. that has nothing, owning is a, a we're not going to get into this argument. That has nothing to do with what we need to do. Right, but you're you're what saying you what other towns are doing. doing. That's what other towns are doing. Yeah, I mean, there's a group of towns that filed a mid petition, you know, and the hearing is on October seventh, and it's open to the public. Um, 
That's just something well, else. Have what we considered that? Or, what? Or did the select board that? Maybe not. No. Well, are they considered not doing it? Hasn't been a topic. Okay. <laughs> no. So where? Looking for something. So looking for just, something. Just on round, numbers. just on round numbers. Yeah. If you went back to the eight hundred and twenty-three students that we had five years ago. Eight. Yeah. Eight hundred and twenty-three, and you divide it, and you divide it by twenty-four thirty-three households. You're at about thirty-four percent. If you take the decline student number now, which is six hundred and fifty-one students, and you divide it by the same number of households, twenty-four thirty-three. Yep. You end up with the, roughly twenty-five percent. Twenty. Yeah. So when you add the, when you add those up for 134 units, 100 and beaver, and yeah. 34. If at one extreme you got 34 students, and in another extreme you've got 46 students. So, I mean, those seem like a reasonable point in sand. Either of those students to go with here. Um, you know, differential between the two is 12. You know, it's. Right. I mean, it's, I it's think we need number. to come up with a number and get going on this because we've right. got to roll in fire and police and DPW and it all builds off of, you know. If I can make a brief comment. I do recall in the SLB that the developer did present a grid of <laughs> maybe nine or 10 similar developments that he had at 138, not 157. And the student count was somewhere in the 30s. I don't remember, but it was somewhere in, which is a number you're kind of pushing around here. But I remember seeing that. I can't remember whether he took you know, account for one, two, and three bedrooms, but he looked at other developments and he had a lot of them that were all within the 100 to 200 area and said, how many kids? Yeah, the problem with that is it's not apple to apple to compare Manchester by the sea. Oh, I like, agree with that. To Wayland, right? Like I'll pick on Wayland because that, that's where one of his developments were. Wayland is next to all the W towns, right? Well, it's yeah. Next to West End and Wildly. Towns. They were right. big bucks towns. That's my point. So if you're already renting in one of those nice towns, Dover, Sherborne, Wayland, Weston, you know, like there's no incentive to then, you know, hop to the next town over just because it's a new apartment unit because you're already, right? You're already Where it's very different than us here, right? Like I could, right, draw a radius of 30 minutes and there's plenty of towns that have public schools that are nowhere near as good as ours. And so all of a sudden, if there's an opportunity to go rent the two bedroom or three bedroom, you're going to jump on that. It's it's very different. Apples and oranges. Except the the only counter I'll make to that, Mike, is the fact that the history over the last five years has shown that families are not moving into Manchester to use the school system because I, our our student count is declining. And can I address that? Because if to get into access the school system, you need to buy a house for 1.6, that's very different than if you can go rent a two or three bedroom for 1825, right? Like that's but, that's part of that's those, part of what explains those that. are not our rents in town. We have lots of rentals, but they're not <laughs> in that price range. <laughs> sure, the eight thousand dollar house is over by right, but that's not what that's not sawmill what... brook, sawmill, sawmill circle. 8,000. Is 8,000 and their townhouses about 2,200 square feet. They're not huge mansions. There's right. several houses for rent right now, but they're all four, 5,000 yeah. homes. And my, my point is if you add 100 units over their Beaver Dam, I, as much as the developer would love it, he's not going to get eight grand a month in rent for all those 100. Right. I agree with that. Like they're going to be market, whatever market, you know what I mean? And and so then. But we don't, even, we don't even know if they'd be rentals. They could all be sold as condos. And then the condo owner buys it and rents it out. So we end up at the same place. Yeah. It's it's a challenge because we don't know. My well, point is on the declining enrollment, it's just if the only way to access the schools is to either rent a house for eight grand or buy one for 1.6 million, that's a much tougher lift, heavier lift than if you can rent a two or three bedroom for you know, 2,500, three grand, right? Like those are, you know. Those are two different things. I would think we could use the, the fact that we have a very highly rated school system as defense for using Maury's conservative numbers. For 46? Yeah, and then just leave it at that and move on. I agree with that. Okay. Does that make sense? 
that that makes sense. I think that's I, I, I go back to what Maury said about the, conservative. the 90, whatever that is, 90, whatever we did for SFO. You just, you said, and I appreciate that you and Mark spent a lot of time and you came up with 90 and like, that actually smells good, right? What I'm struggling divided with. divided by, what is it, 157? 155? Like that? 90, 67% of 90 is 57. What I'm struggling with is defending the methodology, which I think is solid. It was right. used for a facility. Yes. But not having the same known factors right. that we dealt with then, mm -hmm. which I wasn't even around. Right. So I don't, I, I guess I'm struggling with not understanding why we can't on the margin add a couple of heads there as a risk premium for not knowing some of the stuff we need. I don't know how that fits into the methodology, but. Does that make sense? 10% safety factor. Yeah, something like that. So go with 50? Yeah, no, some sort of risk premium there, just so because we don't we don't have the same knowledge base that we have. I, I, I like I, you know, I like the, I like the rationale for the numbers that Maury was, you know, was yes, identifying. Yeah. And I can certainly get behind you know, having a little bit of padding on top of it simply because we don't know what the development's gonna be. Yeah. And at the end of the day, like Dean was saying, you know, we're struggling with these little numbers for the school system. Okay. Which yeah. are not a problem. On the margin, add, adding a few heads to be a little more conservative is going to change the equation. No, and I, I think the other thing we have to recall is because I kind of went through and, and wrote down um, how many students there were in each grade. Um, and there's, you know, it ranges from low 70s um, up to 90s, with the exception of grade 11, which is 111. Which will be gone in a couple of years. So we're running in the the seventies to you know low seventies to ninety ish people per grade, which is which is not very many. And the other thing we have to recall is we have something like eighty two school choice, which the schools have used to fill empty seats. These are these are total students per grade, Essex and Manchester. Yes. Yeah. Manchester is only between 25 and 60. It's not more heavily voted in the first eight years. Yeah, I was curious about that. And no. it, does it thin out when you get into the last five no. years? The high school, high school is a little more than the others. Really? The kid, the low, the elementary grades are lower. They certainly will. I'm talking about just for Manchester. When you look at just Manchester, Manchester is is heavily weighted, more heavily weighted. Um, Seventh grade, ninth through twelfth. Really? Yeah. Just the opposite. Yeah. I don't know, but I, I also think that a, the thing the thing we have to recall with these numbers is that COVID was in 2020, 2021, and a lot of parents pulled their kids out of the Manchester school who were young, the young kids because the schools didn't come back online and the private schools did. And then once they went to private school, they stayed, they stayed there. Um, so I think it is, you know, that is- Subject to change is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, no, it's hard to correlate those. Wait, can we work with 50? Yep, we can use 50. <laughs> for all the arguments you've all put forward, <laughs> there are certain knowns and certain things that are just not I, known. I need to say for the record that I'm not in agreement at all. So, I mean, I know we didn't take a vote, but I'm not in agreement at all. That that would be the calculation. That would be the calculation if you took the SLV at the 90 yacht times the smaller size of Beaver Dam. No, you're using a percentage oh, of 0.5. No, no. Please, no, the, the number was. One, okay, well, let me take the 134. 134 divided by 157, right? No, we can't. Which would be 86%. So okay. you're using, using 0.86 for the beaver dam units? No, this is total. So I'm using the total 134 units, the total new units of 134, okay? And that's 86% of the 157 units originally proposed at Sylvie. And um, 
90 times 0.86 is 77. Which seems high to me. Yeah, if you do, high. if you do the hundred, the um, sixty-four percent of the ninety is um, sixty. What is yeah? Sixty-four times ninety is fifty-seven. So we're using fifty. I would say the fifty number sounds reasonable because the one hundred you could do a comparison with that salt. Yeah, it's a it's a ratio, it's so but the thirty four are, are threaded through the community, right. and it's it's a it's a little ad here and a tear down of a garage, a little ad there. It's right. it's very into the fabric kind of thing. It's so just, I don't think that and we want to stick with thirty four. Not the, We have no better data. What was the total number you went to SLB? One hundred fifty seven. One fifty seven. That was what the calculations were done on by the finance committee. The actual project came in at 136 after the lift. You were doing it during the lift. Okay. What? So for the assessments, can we use the assessment the Finance Committee came up with for SLV times the percentage? Yep. of the 100 and increase it by 26% for the increase in assessments oh, no. since that year. Right. And then for the ones in town, use 1,500 square feet of the 350. And that comes out to what number? No. Just, okay, that calculation comes out to how many students? I'm talking about assessments, not students. Oh, I'm sorry. I think we must no. still. I'm talking, I've Are moved you? away from students. Okay. I'm talking about revenue. What is the dollars for you? Either assessment or annual project tax. The assessment for the 34 would be 525 per unit. The assessment would be 525. 525,000, which is um, about 5,000 taxes per unit. Forty nine hundred using the fifteen hundred and using the no, no. per square foot assessment that they use at Sawmill Sir, just no. for the structures, not no. including land. I'm just doing structure calculations. Yes. So that would be the increase in assessment mm -hmm. within the town, which mm -hmm. if you take um, forty nine hundred times thirty four. We're talking about 167,000 additional taxes. I, I like to think about per unit, so I'll go with your 520. Okay. okay. And then for the Beaver Dam, so the Finance Committee had assumed a 46,099,800 assessment. Theirs was a little higher than the report. That was for SLV at 157. If you take 63.7% of that, which is what 100 the Beaver Dam would be, 100 units, that's 63.7%. Yep. 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 That would come out to an assessment of 29,365. And then if you increase it by 26% for the amount the assessments in town have increased from, that from 20, I only have it back to 2021, from 2021 to, um, to, to 2023, that would come out to an assessment of 37 million. I, uh, I would not use rate. that increase. I'd be concerned that the, uh, that increase is going to go away when we have to deal with more increased congestion. That the values will go down. I don't think I don't agree with that, Dean. What what, what do you end up in dollars for the for the Oh, it would be um, it's 37 million divided by 100. 370,000. Yeah, yeah. It's a low. That's, 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 that's a good deal. <laughs> that is a good deal. That's, that's not market price. That's, 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 that
we don't have any other property in town that we can extrapolate from. Um, Actually, um, I don't have it with me, but Greenbelt did some assessments when they did the appraisal of that property. That has nothing. I'm not doing land. I mean, yeah, okay. So, so townhouses. If that wouldn't work. I got to think of those mm -hmm. townhouses on Pine Street. Mm -hmm. One's just sold for over a million. Those, those aren't good. Ones. Could be. We don't know. Well, or it could all be senior assisted living housing. I have no idea what that would be assessed at. Yeah. I mean, that's what people in town want. Is it, you know, 55 plus with a living fair unit and, you know, assisted living and apartments and, you know. I'd be holding support of that. Yeah. Well, we don't know. And we don't know about the time cost of this. No, is this going to happen over 10 or 15 years or is it going to happen over two years? Well, no. my opinion is, my opinion is there's 177 communities that are right. doing the zoning. And there's a lot of them that have had to zone for a lot more units and they're allowing big multi-story buildings. I, see. I think the developers will go there first. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so now when we talk to police and fire and DPW with the CST, they said there's no additional cost. What was it for SL? We didn't, we didn't we get added numbers something. from them. No. He's extrapolating yeah. from uh, the current population. Yeah. You say it again. They said for CST, no additional cost. No additional cost. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they have two people per shift, or twenty, you know, three people, three shifts per day, or two people a day. And, yeah, well, it's a commercial. It's a commercial entity, right. it's different right. than a place where people live twenty four seven, three sixty five, and yeah, it's not right. Right. But the but that's that's not not a a for police and fire. It's not a it blog. wasn't a real number. Oh, okay. but it was. It's like it's maybe it's very hundred and seventy employees by the time the whole thing gets running. Coming and going it's twice a day. Per call. And so when okay. you look at that and say, okay, somebody's going to fall in the stairway and somebody's going to do whatever. It's 200. 000. But it's almost, it's like, it's almost built into the structure of what we already have for police and fire. If, if you're telling me the answer is greater than zero, I'm with you because it, it is. It's My great. point is more whatever the police and fire cost for a commercial entity is, residential right. is high. That's my own point. If it's zero for CST, I think we're on the same page. It's probably not zero because there are going to be employees that get hurt. There are going to be calls. There's going to be smoke alarms or I don't whatever. Yeah, but right? based on the number of calls projected, it didn't require any additional staffing. Right. Mm -hmm. the CST. That was. I think yeah. that was the thing. Is there were so few additional calls that it and this wasn't is also handled. this is also a very very dialed in facility with a lot of sensors and a lot of a lot of assets and yeah. equipment. It's not a steel mill. Yeah, you yeah, know yeah. where you can have suddenly the half the building's on fire. You know it's a Absolutely. different. My know, point is just <laughs> residential is a different animal. Right, that's yeah, that's yeah. my yeah. only yeah. point. Did right? we end up assessing that there was going to be an additional fire uh, department? No. So we said that. No, it wasn't done on that. It was just done on a what number, number of calls. What did, what's it, it called? It wasn't the specific number that made us think that they were going to have to add that. No, I'm right. sort of off the top of my head. I, I think it was 220,000. No, I couldn't write here. Um, police was 219 calls at 475 each for 104,000. Fire was 76 calls at a, 1,100 each for 83,600. So, 200, so it was just an extrapolation of the per all charge, but but you don't incur additional costs unless you need additional people. Right. Well, I'm going for different equipment, dude, but that's all the it's being conservative and it's not an issue. The big one was um, even the SLV consultant put in 10 grand for DPW costs. And we said, they were saying, oh, we don't need that. But I think that that's the big, you're going to have sidewalk, intersection improvements, drainage improvements, water and sewer you know, there, there could be, I think- That the, the would be paid for by a developer. 
if if you have a a, a development with a hundred units, they would pay for the sidewalk in front of the development. They wouldn't pay for a sidewalk all the way down that one. That would be part of the permitting. That's process. what's all being negotiated with CST. Right. Wow. So it's all you know. I I don't think that that's something. I that think the town would have to bear the cost of. I think the that's not how developments work. Are we still talking about CST? Or are we talking about additional residential? We're talking about, I thought we were talking about the um, MBTA zoning and the, the police and the fire, we can use the SLV stuff, but the DPW, I was saying, we said zero for SLV and even the developer put in 10 grand. And, and I, I think we should put something in. Yeah, I agree. We should put something, like the answer is not zero. Like, I, and I don't know how you come up with the number, but it, it's not zero. I mean, when you think about the pie of the total town budget, what's DPW? It's large. I was gonna guess fifteen percent. Water too, and enterprise. Mm -hmm. so, uh, mm -hmm. Not far off, right? Thank you. Yeah, fifteen is pretty close. I'm somewhere in the ballpark, right? Yeah. It's roughly what one point eight over fourteen. It's the Fourth biggest department because you get schools, police, fire, and then DPW. The fourth biggest. Um, DPW is 1.352, um, 1.442, I think is what we came up with. But um, then you, I, I, I think we got to add in all the other little components. Right, you got to add uh, snow yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Sanitation, so it's, it's two million. It's two million, yeah. Two million out of so two million out of forty-two. Two million, make it two and a half. Two and a half percent. Two and a half percent. Oh, that's right. Sorry. Oh, no, I'm gonna say five percent. Five percent. Which is probably about right. Five, five, five. Police, fire, DPW, school of fifty. Yeah. Then you got town government in there. Well, my point is just to zoom to assume zero is crazy, right? And I don't know how you get there, but that's why I was just talking about the pie, whatever percentage of the pie is, like you know, increase it a little. That's a that's that's a ratio, right? Like that's what we're doing with everything else, right? Right. We do it by the number of units. So the increase in number of units versus what we have today times. So if we have something that's like budget, I mean, 34 units over. No, we're plus, talking 130, 134. Versus the over 2400 divided by 2400 <laughs> total number of households. And you can take, you can just take the total assessed value. Of those 134 units, and then five percent. Right, the five percent yeah. of the pie thing. Yeah, right? and honestly, using assessed, you're coming in a little low, but whatever. At least there's a methodology there. Say five percent of the tax rate. I'm saying take the total assessed value of these 134 units. That's going to give you a dollar value. I'm saying take five percent of that. We'll have to calculate the DPW. I'm saying for the yeah. DPW. Yeah. Of that thirty-seven percent of the total yeah. budget, yeah. And there's your that's your incremental EPW mm -hmm. cells. Um, it's it's a very obviously forty thousand foot, but right. at least it's got logic. It's got you know, it's not zero. Right, it's not zero, and it's well, EPW spends a lot of money. Yes, you get all the projects in there. Yes, yeah. capital. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> It's the first time I've heard you talk about 40,000 feet. I mean, usually it's 10 or 20. <laughs> Usually 30, I was out. Usually 30, Suddenly 30, 30. we really jumped up. I upped it, I upped it 10. I mean, yeah, I, yeah. That must, that's indicative of you're something. In the, you're in the stratosphere. About that. that. That's good. I was making sure you're paying attention. Yeah, well, just <laughs> barely. Really high level. It's usually 20,000. 20, Really? Yeah, and you answer something else. Um, 
Um, uh, Gail circulated minutes. Did anybody have time to look at them? I did look at them. They look fine to me. Is anybody pretty simple because we just sort of, you know, was everyone the date? Oh, the 18th, 18th, I think it was. Yes, September 18th. Okay, okay. Somebody want to make a motion to approve them? Oh, no, I had a comment. So, under the one bullet, it was noted that it would be a benefit to have previous fiscal year data with the proposed fiscal year budget. I remember it as being that we wanted to include any associated revenue projections with the operating costs. And that wasn't, that was, remember that was something we were in agreement on as far as one of the things um, that, that we wanted to have. So any operating costs, right. we, right. wanted, we wanted to we see did. the revenue. But we also wanted the debt prior data. So you can include that one if you thought that that was valid. But I, I wanted to include the one that I was looking for to include any revenue and operating costs so that we can see what these costs okay. are bringing in, you know, on the same. Yeah. Thing. We were always flipping. So we have an amendment right? to include that. I'm we working out that. that. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of numbers moving around. Yes. Oh. Yeah. So, so we have we're, so where's this edit? I'm sorry. Well, I think it's just an added bullet now. Oh, okay. I agree with you. It just needs to be added. Yeah. 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 Right. And, and maybe I do recall that too, right? Mm -hmm. Because the collections, she was showing them under collections, but the collections don't that's translate to the department. That's, that's right. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Right. They're there, but in the wrong place. Yeah. So can we refer to the wrong places? Okay. So I'm going to motion to refer to September 18th. And that's what he's proposed to have the operating including revenue. Yeah. Including revenue with the operating costs by the department. Yeah. Perfect. Associated so revenue. Take a vote. Andy? Maury? Yes. Dean? Yes. Mike? I understand. Tom? Yes. Peter? Yes. Sarah votes yes. Okay. Um, next meeting, I believe we have a joint meeting with the select board on Monday night, the 7th. Um, I'm waiting for confirmation. The purpose of that meeting would be to discuss the fiscal year 26 priorities. Too bad John left. Fiscal year 26 priorities that the select board came up with at their workshop over the summer. And it would be at 7. Monday the 7th. Next Monday. And I have a conflict that night, so I will not. Okay. Next. Seven. Yeah. Seven. Okay. Um, and then we have a meeting on the 16th. And I'm hoping that at that meeting, Greg will be able to present us with the long term capital budget. Anything else we want to cover at that? Okay. And I will try to write up what we discussed tonight. Might have to and circle it's circulated. Okay. Okay. And then we'll repeal, we'll come back for that uh, 16th to our actual vote. I think so, yeah. 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 Um, I think the planning board wants it before then, but I just don't think that's realistic. You know, they're not going to be having public meetings before the 16th. So should we have on our agenda um, the town meeting more? What what's yeah, I'll meeting? put the here. Yes. Oh, I was curious whether there was a plan to vote on these MBTA <laughs> districts individually or just the one up or down? One. It's one. Um, we're voting on the zoning changes, mm -hmm. which includes the districts in the zoning change. So it's one big vote. Do we know of any warrant articles at this point in time? I am not aware of anything. CBC. What? Oh, maybe the flagpole. That's like dogs on the beach. Oh. That's going to suck all the air out of 
Sorry. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's double dogs on the cage. So. Yeah. Twice as much resources. Yeah. So, so. Trying. And, and the other thing I know that's on the warrant we're going to have to vote on is that um, there were two bills um, for consultants for the um, SLV appeal that the town hired and apparently the bills never got to Andrea. So they're prior year bills that we have to vote on. Okay, they're we're talking, I don't know what it was, 5,000 maybe, it's not, not big bucks, but somehow, yeah, prior year fiscal. I, I, she didn't have, she had done all the transfers so she had no money left in the budget. And so then where do they then come out of when they're voting? It's a, it's a supplemental appropriation for the fiscal year 26, I think, budget. We okay. can't. Is that what it is, 26? Yeah, it's got to come out of the 26 because we've already closed out yes. 25. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just up our tax rate. Okay. Am I allowed to ask a question? I didn't see it from the public comment. Anything, but... Yeah, we'll allow you. We weren't, weren't going to take public comment. But you, don't you like made the effort to come to this meeting. Yeah. And sat through all of this. Yeah, I kind of sat through it. Just a quick question. So when so when you're doing the fiscal analysis, just because obviously you know I'm involved, but coming to town meeting, I think my thought process is when you guys are putting this together, I think people, including myself, want to know whether you vote yes or no. I don't care. But if you were to vote yes or you were to vote no, I think people like myself want to look at, okay, here's a fiscal analysis if we vote yes and we have this estimated 50 out of students, yes. da, 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 compared to the grants that we may or may not get, okay? Like yep. that are built into this four buckets of money. I'm not including the 13 added in the guidelines with this four bucket yeah, of grant. Yeah. And people are going to ask you that right. question. They're gonna go, okay, right. that thing come Ms. Mellish, blah, blah, blah. Like you I, know, students per year. I mean, I know that we were down yet last year at 1160 students and we were running low, but our budget was still the highest it's been in a long time, we're at right. 30 million, we know that. So we're still paying X amount of dollars for every student that you bring into the district to measure 20,000, 22,000, whatever. Again, 10 years, whatever. It's just looking at that number and saying to somebody, okay, like every year you're going to have enough million dollars coming in that we're going to pay onto this budget versus 4 million over 10 years of grant money that you might use. Yeah, and I have all of that grant yeah, information. I'm just, well, yeah, and I do too. And it's just one of those things that I, I want, that, that's what I want to I meant to discuss it. And I forgot to. But well, you don't have to discuss it tonight. It's fine. But I'm just saying that presentation so would be really great. We have some information on the grants. And the other thing, which I was going to put in and just kind of reflect with the tax rate, with how that would impact the tax rate. Um, if we and get... also caveat the fact that the state's seeking more money from the federal government to give out as grants. So grants could change over time with climate resiliency, that type of thing. We don't know. We don't. Um, and then the other thing um, I was going to put in a, a little blurb about um, if we don't have any money from the state, it would mean that affordable housing projects would not be feasible because 80% of the funding for those projects comes from state sources, um, grants and tax credits. Oh, yeah. Um, so I was going to put that in too, just so that people, because people yeah. like affordable data. Yeah. I think people want to know if you don't get the grants, is right. what it's going to be over right. a period of time versus the implications of taking on this infrastructure right. and the students and the families and whatever. Right. It could actually be we're spending more money or losing more money as a community by right. voting mm -hmm. yes versus voting no and losing out on grants. Either way, I'm not saying I want either one. I'm just saying having that data that makes it cool. It's just going to be one question that's going to be answered by you guys right away. And, and it's not going to go on for 10 hours at town meeting, right? About the financial piece that's yeah. going to be asked, you know? So I just yeah. want to make sure that 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 budget is complete. Yes and no. Here's the pros and cons yeah. of both sides. I think that'd be really, really helpful. And we'll do things in a range too, you know, just awesome. so that it's not that'd be really, really yeah. great. Yeah, um, I appreciate it. You, the only problem, unfortunately, is as you can tell from watching this meeting, there's a lot of subjective right. input, right? So there's some factual things. It costs twenty-five thousand a year for student MERS. So there's hundred units, you know, north, right? 
like there's some hard numbers, but then you get into some of the other stuff, and as you can tell, it's, but it's also you're not guaranteed to get a grant either, right? I mean, no, that's, even, that's right, that's right. subjective as well. And yeah. you might apply for a two million dollar dredging grant, but most of the time you're only getting half from the state, and then the big comes in low, and you're getting even half of that. It's a range, right? right. So, those are the things that you may. You may add the $2 million dredging grant in there, but it's never going to be $2 million. It's going to be X, right? So it's just a range and just having those. Or even, even to give people a sense of if there's $2 million of grants, if, if we don't get $2 million of grants, what's that due to the tax rate? Yeah, that's yeah. also useful. You know, yeah. that, that was, and that's yeah. yeah, such great information yeah. for people to really make. I mean, you know, that decision on November right. 18th, just to see the pros and cons on both sides. Right, right? exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just so that people have the data. Absolutely. Because I was talking, I put a letter to the editor in this week's paper to kind of do some fact checking right. on like last week's letter. Um, yeah, nothing to do with that. <laughs> um, and I was talking to somebody who said he was dead set against it. And then when I was kind of talking about the zoning and exactly what the impacts might be. It's all oh, he says. I'm glad I talked to you. It's like you know, you know people don't have a clue. They, they, you know, that's why the facts are really important and the data right. that you guys put together for the. It, it'll just make it easy and hopefully the meeting will be quicker. You know, and then we're not there for seven hours trying to just debate numbers. It's clear cut from the finance committee, and I think you guys right. did a great job. So. Yep. Thank At you. the end of the day, no one's got a crystal ball though. No. Well, like, no. like, we got it. SLV no. was a binary, right? It was there were two situations, zero or I know, I know. Right? I know. <laughs> it was very at least able to, right? This he's now at five five six. Six. big bucks to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you just came down to five thousand feet. But you're better off at 40. 40. Stick to forty. All in favor of returning, raise your hand. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Donna. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Thanks for, uh, for all the stuff. Yes, thank you for the preliminaries. Oh, I'm struggling. Uh, you can tell I'm right. struggling with it. Well, it's called remember SLV. We're, we're, we're looking for something better than that, you know. And how long do we have to wait before we're going to get the whole operation? Three, three weeks in, we got three more three weeks. Now. Three more weeks. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I never asked. And you are right. Right. Yeah. Yeah.